the title of the message today is um, is a road trip. So we're going to talk about going on a road trip. Now, years ago, um, when people used to use station wagons, you know, the uh, station wagon. <laughs> Um, there, were, there weren't very many sports cars. The, most of them were family rigged station wagons. And who had the station wagon where the back seat faced backwards so you get to wave to all the cars that came up? <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, who had the station wagons where there was two seats in the back that faced each other so you could fight with your brother and sister? Those, so then you had to look this way and that way. Yeah, the station wagon. So road trip for us years ago, some of us that are of the station wagon generation, um, there were certain things you did on the road trip. Most of our trips were to see relatives. It wasn't Disneyland, and this, it was see relatives. And that was, yay, we get to go and see our cousins. And some of you had, um, had relatives that owned farms. And so going to the farm, and you get to take off your shoes and go through the manure in, in the, uh, the farms. And, you know, you get to go into the feed bin. And when they pulled the cord to feed the cow, you d that would go down and you get sucked down. Anybody be a part of that thing? Yeah, there's some of you doing that. So, um, so we're going to talk about getting ready to go on a, a trip. And I've got some things here. I know it says Merry Christmas, so Merry Christmas early to you, but this was the biggest bag I could find. And so um, uh, I need some help here. So uh, Taylor, would you come and pull something out of there except for the big red thing that you saw the other night? Just pull anything out of there that you see. Okay, well, we're going to go on a road trip. And uh, so because you have a hard time with your sister or brother, you, you get to wear these on your road trip. So that's part of our, our, our trip. Okay, Michaela, could you come and we'll just put that here. So we're just getting ready for a trip. You got to be ready, right? Especially if you can't stand your sibling. You get, okay, you never know, you know, when you stop at the rest stop or even get to a cousin's place, you got you to gotta have some fun and play football. Okay, Caden, come on up here and see if you can grab something out of there. Wyatt, you're next, so get ready. Um, okay, no, that's not part of it. Get something else out. Okay, it's hard to see. Let me help you there. Um, there we go. Okay, yeah. So you got to be ready with a baseball mitt. You know, you can never, you know, uh, mom might need something to take something hot out of the oven. You, you never know how handy that could be. Okay, Wyatt, come on up and pull something out of here. We got to be ready for the trip. Now, not the, not the big thing. No, not the big okay. thing. That, that's the last thing. Anything else in there? I know you. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Yeah, pipe wrench. Pipe wrench. You know, this will fit on just about everything. And it can be a hammer, too. So, you know, you don't leave home without your pipe wrench in your car. Now, some of you would say channel locks, but, you know. Uh, so, I didn't bring my big one, my 24-inch. I, I brought my little one. That's a little one. That's a little one. So, uh... We'll come back to any other kids in here that want to pull out of my bag here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah you're a big kid. <laughs> okay, we'll give you a chance. So open up your scriptures to Luke chapter 10. So Jesus is getting ready, uh, his disciples ready for their uh, road trip. And this is a, a missionary trip. This is a mission trip, uh, and so different than just a road trip. But um, he's getting them ready for that. And so because you've been with me, you know that Jesus has been getting tougher and tougher on his disciples. 
Um, and he's uh, been rearranging their thought process of who's greatest in his kingdom, you know, and so we went through all that. Even last week, we saw where someone said, I'll follow you, and he's, he was saying, are you sure you want to follow me? See, I have no place to lay my head. I have no home. Are you sure you want to follow me? And someone else, he said, follow me. And they said, let me go bury my father. And he said, no, I'm more important than your family. Put me first. And he said, you go and preach the kingdom of God. And so we're, we're scratching our heads going, where's the love? But ultimately, he's saying, when you put me first, I'll take care of the rest of this. And so finally, at the end of verse 62 of Luke chapter 9, he says, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. No back doors. No, if you've believed in Jesus, you come and follow me. No turning around. Uh, no doing what Peter did. And let's go. F I'm going to go back fishing. <laughs> Done with this. No. Follow me. So he's been, he's been uh, training them to trust him. And now they're ready to go on this trip without him. So they are being sent by two by two into the near cities um, to get them ready for the kingdom. And they're cities that he's going to come into. So they're like the forerunners. They're going ahead of him and getting, getting things set up. And so here they go. Now, um, the 12 were a part of this that were sent off. Chapters earlier, he sent the 12 already, but now there's 70, and some of your Bibles say 72, but now there's about 70 that he's got them ready, and they probably said, I'll go, and Jesus made sure they were all ready to go. So look at chapter 10 with me of Luke, and look at the first verse. The first verse says, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city um, where he was about to go. So he's sending them ahead of him into every city. Okay, so there are um, several things, several steps that he's getting them ready with. And so we're going to count them. There's about seven of them that I counted, and we can change that a little bit if we want. But here we go. Verse 2, this is the first thing in getting ready to go on this trip for Jesus, and it's all about prayer. Isn't that beautiful? Verse 2, then he said to them, the harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. Therefore, beseech or Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. That's an amazing prayer right there. That's agreeing with the Lord that there's work to be done. And if you've believed on the Lord Jesus, you said, send me. I'll go. Because that's the spirit of Christ. That's his whole plan is to send people out to share the kingdom of God. So go to Isaiah. In your notes, you'll see I've got Isaiah written there. Isaiah chapter uh, 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And uh, the prophet there, Isaiah, uh, he... Um, he has this vision about um, the Lord. And in it, in verse um, 8, Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, he says, um, Also I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? And who will go before us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And then he talks about sending them to a place where um, they're not going to hear him. They're not going to be repentant. But he said, just go. And he asked, how long? But he says, here I am, send me. So this, this time of, uh, of, of praying God's 
purpose, God's focus. That's the most profound prayer that you and I could ever pray is for salvation for lost ones in your family, for salvation for people all around us. Um, but, but this one where the Lord says, the harvest is plenty full, but the workers are few. So I even thought how much have I prayed about us really seeing serious that we need to be about his harvest. We need to be about the kingdom stuff. So whether, whether you're going on a mission trip overseas or whether your ministry is right here, that, that harvest is ready. Are, are we ready to do it? Are we, is that our focus for the day when we set out? So the harvest, the harvest. So number one is prayer. Praying God's purpose. So what we're doing here is we're looking at what Jesus was doing with um, his disciples, getting them ready to go out on this road trip, go out on this mission trip. So it was a one-time thing. Right now, they were being trained by the Lord, and this was their time. They saw what Jesus did, and he told them, now this is the part of training where they, they get to do it. And isn't that, isn't that the beautiful thing about us when we go to school or when we're training something? We learn the book work and then we've got to go do it. Well, here's that time. Okay. So uh, he tells them the first thing is pray. Make sure you're praying about this harvest. You're praying about God's kingdom. Second thing, um, there's a warning that goes out and he talks about wolves talks about woes and he says there in verse 3 so this is the second of uh, this instruction for this group go your way and behold I send you out as lambs among wolves now that doesn't sound very good that doesn't sound very good matter of fact there's a lot of people that send their kids to um, learn how to do karate and you know and then they make those stances and they, they, they they're ready to encounter and to fight back and and Jesus is saying I'm sending you out as lambs lambs are pretty defenseless aren't they what, what do they have to fight with you know they got these little teeth that, that's weird but, but the Lord's saying, I'm sending you out like lambs in the midst of wolves. How does that work? So he's, he's telling them this is going to be tough. And he says, I'm getting you ready, but know this. There's wolves out there. Turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 10 is the cross-reference to this same thing in Luke. But he gives a little more detail in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. And uh, it's kind of scary. It's kind of like, well, what did I just sign up for? Um, but in verse 16, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And here's the wolves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before men and governors, kings, for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Did, did you see what 18 was saying, verse 18 was saying? He's saying, I'm sending you out to get into these places to be a testimony for me. And the only way you can get into these places places to be a testimony for me is that you're going to be scourged in the synagogues and governors and you're going to be brought before governors and kings kind of like you're going to come in the back door <laughs> you're not going to be paraded and and um, honored to go before governors and kings as somebody great and wonderful you're going to be over here brought in and you're going to be looked down upon so these are the wolves that he's saying for this group of people that are being sent out. He's saying, there's a warning here and kind of like, are you ready for this? I'm telling you, it's going to come. Now, what we're doing right now is we're going, 
how does this apply to me right now? And that's as it should be. As we listen to the word of God, we are always going, okay, that's what Jesus was doing with the, the 70 right then. And, and how much of this is he meaning for me right now? Is he warning me about what the future might look like? Am I tough enough to, to follow Jesus and say, I'm going to bless the Lord no matter what? So that's what's happening. As the Holy Spirit is, is helping you to digest this as we look at what Jesus was doing with his 70 men right there, sending them out two by two, he was telling them, get ready. This thing is looking pretty tough. Okay. Now, if you continue reading here, and I did, it just gets worse and worse. It talks about, well, children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. And, you know, just like, no, no, this can't happen. He's telling them, maybe even here he's prophesying about the future, but he's telling them, this is going to be pretty rough. And this is what the 70 signed up for. I'm, I'm going. I'm going to go on this trip for the Lord. So for you and me, it's like, where is that limit? No, no, you can only ask so much of me, Lord. I can only take so much. Or are you saying, Lord, send me, equip me, empower me by your Holy Spirit to do what I can't do. I'd like you to turn to Psalm 23. Because I thought, in the midst of all that, how is the Lord going to take care of me? I'm just a sheep or I'm just a lamb. You're saying I don't have any defenses against the wolves. And I want you to see out of Psalm 23, he's going to take care of you and me. He is our defense. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I have no need. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. Maybe you're here today and your soul is being restored. Maybe you've been beat up by the world or this week. Maybe just in your own mind, you're going, woe is me. I... He restores your soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And here's verse 4. It says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, or though I walk through the wolves, <laughs> though I walk through sin that leads to death, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You know, I don't have to get all anxious and my shoulders get drawn up and I get, I get worried and I get fearful. He says, I don't have to. <laughs> Why? Because you are with me. Amen? You are with me. He says, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they will comfort me. So he's going to use his rod and staff to defend the wolves. <laughs> He's going to lead me. I'll be able to follow him. He will protect you and me. So I'm glad I don't hear of you guys running out to take up karate and stuff, getting ready for the future. <laughs> I'm glad you're depending on the Lord to be your protector, that he is the one. So he says, so much so, he says, you have prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow, what a place of peace, right? You no worries. <laughs> no, no worries. He's with you. He's going to defend you. Everything that happens, he knows everything and he's with you, and he's going to help you through whatever it is. And I'm thinking, I'm looking out here seeing that many of you are going, he's been there. He's been there. And so I'd like to have you just raise your hand if you can go, he's been with me. I know he's with me. He's been my help all along the way. Amen. That is, and he'll show himself faithful to you again. 
So he warned his disciples back in Luke chapter uh, 10. So the first one is make sure you pray. Pray about the harvest. The second one is, you know, beware the wolves. It's going to happen. And, uh, but I'll, I'll help you. I'll be your defender. And so then the fourth one is to trust his training. So not only is he sending us out like wolves, but he says, look, I'm going to take away all that stuff that you're going to take with you on your trip. <laughs> I'm going to make you even uh, uh, less um, dependent uh, and more dependent on me, less dependent on your stuff. And uh, so he says in, in verse 4, carry neither money bag, knapsack or sandals and greet no one along the way so you're on a mission so all this stuff leave the football leave the earplugs leave, leave the pipe wrench leave all this stuff and he says really he's saying trust me trust me in my training of you trust me there's some of you that are going through a trusting time right now where you realize that God has been toughening you up and, and you've had to trust him through this stuff. And he's saying, trust me. And maybe even he's saying, will you trust me? Trust my training that when you're weak, I am strong. Trust my training. Trust that I'm going to take care of you no matter what it looks like. There's many of you in this room that... When you were growing up, you look back and go, man, somehow the Lord just, I shouldn't be here. The Lord just moved me along on this journey, and here I am today praising the Lord and wanting to walk with him with all that I have. It's God. You look back, and it's been God the whole time. So Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. So here's that trusting his training. So right now, are you trusting his training even though it seems like it might be too much for you? Are you trusting his training? Trusting he's with you? Trusting him. So, um, the first one is prayer. The second one is uh, beware of the wolves. The next one is trusting his training. And now here's the fourth one. And this one talks about hospitality. Hospitality etiquette, I said. I called it. And so here's what they're telling him. When they go into a city, they're to look for uh, a house of peace. And so look for that hospitable place to stay when you go into that city to do my work, to do my work for the kingdom. Here's the proper etiquette. Here's what happens. It says, uh, verse five, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. Verse seven, remain in that same house, eating and drinking. So we're back in Luke chapter 10, verse seven uh, remain in that same house, eating or drinking such things as they give you, for a laborer's, laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not look, go from house to house. Whatever city you enter um, and they receive you, eat such things as they set before you. Okay, so proper etiquette. I was thinking about this hospitality thing, and I, it came down to three things in my mind. Um, shelter. When you go someplace, shelter out of the weather, shelter so you have a place to stay. Um, safety. Isn't that interesting? I thought. Um, hospitality is uh, shelter and safety. And then the last one is supper. <laughs> you, get, you get food. But to me, that condensed the hospitality that um, we know of. When you used to go on your trip to see your... Uh, your relatives, they, they gave that shelter, they gave that safety, uh, and then they gave you food to eat. You got supper. Um, so you were provided for, um, that kind of thing. 
Um, years uh, have gone by, and I'd have to say that I'm not quite the hospital. I'm not, I'm not set up at my home like my mom. When I was growing up, my mom, her pantry was always full. The freezer was always full. And the refrigerator always had leftovers. And so whoever showed up, she was ready. It was like, well, we have some string beans that they're leftovers. And so whenever you'd show up at the house, it didn't matter if it was mealtime or not. She was putting out cookies or something in front of you. And, and it was like she understood proper etiquette and hospitality of that day, especially of that day. I think most families were like that. When you showed up unexpectedly, they opened the door, and said, come on in. Since you came, why don't you help me? I was just weeding out here. So come on, you know, that kind of, whatever that was, or they, they'd stop everything and they would just be with you and share with you. They'd put everything on hold and they would sit and they'd listen and enjoy. So some of that proper etiquette was even entertainment. Like my dad had a guitar and it was like all of a sudden the guitar came out and let's sing. And, you know, so it was... Uh, Proper etiquette of years ago was just a cool thing to look back on. I want to show you a place where in Jesus' time, proper etiquette wasn't done to him at a, a, a Pharisee's house. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 7. So you're in Luke 9. So just back, just back a couple of chapters. Chapter 7. Um, in verse, uh, verse 44. And so this is where... He, he was invited um, to go share a meal there. And there was a woman that came and, and cried to Jesus and he forgave her. But look at verse 44 of Luke chapter 7. And he turned to the woman. He said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet. No proper etiquette, no hospitality for Jesus at that house. Is that amazing? He was invited by Simon. Simon understood the proper etiquette of the day, but he said, you provided no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. Who was the one that was showing etiquette and beyond? It was one that was coming for Jesus, before Jesus. And he said, you gave me no kiss. So that was the culture of the day. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. Judas used this hospitality to betray our Lord, didn't he? With a kiss, he said, this will identify who Jesus is. But Jesus didn't get the washing of his feet. He didn't get the kiss. And he said then, you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman who has anointed my feet with fragrant oil, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Isn't it amazing? You've heard it said, the scripture does say this, that be careful you may entertain angels. So hospitality is uh, being kind to strangers is another way to say it. But hospitality is part of God's plan. So he said, back in Luke chapter 9, getting his people ready for this trip, his, his uh, disciples ready for this trip, he said, look for this place of hospitality and stay there and allow them to give to the kingdom in that way. Okay? And then here's something that is really cool, I think, is that he says, here's, in my way of saying, here's a gift to give back to them. And it's a gift from me through you to them. And look at verse 9. And he says, And heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. They were given the power to heal the sick in that house, in that place. That was showing thanks for hospitality, but that was in giving with the kingdom. And so the words that they were to say is the kingdom has come near you today, the kingdom. So they're on this trip and everywhere they go, this is their gift that they get to give back 
to those around. They get to heal the sick, and then they proclaim the kingdom of God has come near you today. This is kind of interesting. I didn't bring it with me. I was going to, but a few weeks ago, some of you were here, and there was a native brother that came and did a song for us. You remember that? Um, Chapman, Jerry Chapman. He did a song for us here on his drum. But before he started it, he turned and he said, wait, come over here. And he took out this, this uh, chain or this necklace that was made and he gave it to me. And that was his offering back as a visitor. So he gave me two gifts. He gave me a song and then he gave me something that uh, his wife had made by hand. You and I have gifts to give one another. Some of you have this down. When you go to somebody's place, you bring a little flower or something. It's like, wow, where did they learn that? That's kind of cool. Well, he had that. So this gift that they were given was the Holy Spirit power. It was, at this time, it was given for them right there that they could heal the sick. It was the power of God given to them. So in the scripture, it tells us that we have different gifts that we've been given, gifts of the Holy Spirit for the common good of those around us, for the building up of God's kingdom. So if you've believed on the Lord Jesus, you have a gift. And really what it is is that you are an open vessel for the Holy Spirit to use. He may use you in different ways, in different gifts, but there may be a special one that that. He's given you to use. So I'd like you to go to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about different gifts that the Holy Spirit gives and that we're to use them in uh, building up the kingdom of God and helping one another. But he also talks about it has to be done out of love. It can't be done out of, look at the cool gift I have, the Holy Spirit gave me. It's my gift, it's mine, mine. But it's like, no, no, no. It's like, this is the Holy Spirit gift. You, you've become a vessel to be used by him. So look at verse 4 of chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministry, but the same Lord. There are different uh, diversities of activities, but the same God who works all things and all. But the gift of the Spirit is given to each one for the prop, uh, profit of all. And so what I'd like to do here is I'd like you to stop listening to me and I'd like you to listen to the word of God. And so I want to cover the rest of 12 through 13. And what, what I don't want to happen is the screensaver to go on as I'm reading this, and, but that the Holy Spirit would help each of us to um, weigh every word that's being said about the Holy Spirit gifts to us. Okay, and I'm going to do something uh, um, that wasn't prepared at all, and so I'm just going to see if um, if this if she's willing to do this for us. But um, Diane, I wondered if you'd be willing to read the scripture for us up here from where I stopped on through 13. Okay, so Diane. Um, has a gift to the Holy Spirit of reading scripture or proclaiming scripture. Um, and so you could call it prophecy, but it's, and so you could use uh, what you have there because it's probably different than mine. And so now you don't have to look at me, but you get to look at Diane. Um, so open up your scriptures then. Thank you, sorry about the, not no, warning sorry. you. But what verse do you want me to start with? Um, start at verse mm -hmm. 8, because we finished at verse 7. And then if you go through, all the way through the end of 13. I have glasses. Okay, oh, glasses. Okay. So is this mic on, uh, Tim? Okay. Um, 
Let me just pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, um, may your spirit uh, use your word through Diane and, and through us as we read it to understand that each of us have been given the Holy Spirit and it's going to show up in different ways to help each one of us to serve you in your kingdom here on earth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. How far? Uh, through 13. Okay. Chapter 13. Um, yeah, end at the end of 13. 13.3. 13, 13. Uh, 13, 13. Wait, what? So you're start, starting here and you're going all the way through chapter 13. Okay. And yeah, end on the end of okay. chapter 13. So I'm reading from the New American Standard Version on a phone. I'd prefer to be reading in a book, but... You didn't bring your book today. No, it's no. too heavy. <laughs> <clears throat> I need to adjust this a little bit. Or I'll walk my head on that thing. <clears throat> Tell me again the verse I'm starting with. Verse, Sorry, guys. Verse 8. Uh, I, I caught her off guard, so it's all my fault. <laughs> That's okay. I'm good. For one is given. Yes. Okay. Verse eight. For one, for to one is given the word of the of wisdom, through the Spirit, and to another, the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body, which seem to be weaker, are necessary and those members of the body which we deem less honorable on these we bestow more abundant honor and our less presentable members become much more presentable whereas our more presentable members have no need of it but God has so composed the body giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked so that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, help, admi helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? 
All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I show you a still more excellent way. Chapter 13. Oh yeah, this is a good one. <laughs> Uh-oh. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. <clears throat> Love never fails. But if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. I so desired to uh, read that to you. Um, but she did it in such a better way than I could ever do. And praise God, each of us have something to offer, has to be done in love. Kind of like it doesn't count, <laughs> no matter how severe it is. And this is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So when we're looking at the disciples and they were given this one gift at this time of healing, the superpower of God came through them and they were able to heal and then they proclaimed the kingdom of God has come near you. Each one of us, wherever we're going, wherever we're stepping, the kingdom of God is with you. If you've believed on the Lord Jesus as your savior, if you've believed that he is the son of God, the son of man who came and died on the cross for our sins and that through believing that he has done that, that you have a right relationship with the creator of all things, with God himself, with Jesus, that he then gives you the power to overcome, the resurrection power, the power to have new life. As Jesus came back to life, you will come back to life. You have eternal life. But here and now, you are stepping into that life too. You have a new life to live. Your focus now is on Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Wherever you walk, wherever you go, whatever group you're in, you have something to offer. It's the Holy Spirit. And back in 1 Corinthians, I want to show you something here that just caught me. 1 Corinthians 12, um, verse 11, it says, as a reminder, but one and the same Spirit works all things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And so your part and my part is to be open for him to use. 
Maybe one day you would be given that power to heal. Maybe one day that's up to the Holy Spirit, what he gives. So here they are receiving that and they go out. They're on this journey. So he's telling them them about what they're going to encounter. And let me just remind you in closing here where we've been. The first thing he said that you need to be equipped with on this journey, this mission journey, this road trip that they're going on is to pray and to pray God's purpose that more people would get it, would join the harvest. There needs to be more workers. So he says, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send more harvesters. You and me, where we are, that that's our focus, that we're part of this harvesting. So to pray. And warning, there's, there are going to be wolves out there. You could call them distractions also. They come in various sizes and shapes to distract you from God's plan. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're there every day. You want to serve the Lord, and all of a sudden this happens, or you're tempted over here, and your focus is now you're wandering over here somewhere, and you go, what just happened? What just happened? Ah. Oh. I was going to share something, but I'll just leave it there. You know what I'm talking about. It's just stuff comes to distract you from God's purpose. Once you get off from God's purpose, it's like you're wearing two left shoes. Your stuff just goes wrong and you're miserable. That purpose. So then the distractions and then trusting his training. Whatever you're going through now, when you can say, blessed be the name of the Lord. The trials that you're going through right now, when you say, I'm going to praise my Lord and Savior, that's the Holy Spirit of God. When you're saying, I've learned to be content where I am, Lord, thank you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's Holy Spirit stuff in trusting him and his training for you right now. Trusting him. So then he goes into that hospitality thing, that hospitality thing and and how to give your gifts to those around you with love. Then the last couple of things he goes into is what happens when you're rejected. Now, we all know rejection and it's weird. We have different ways of responding. But here's what he said in a way he says, I'm going to take care of that. Kind of like in Romans, he said, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. I'm going to take care of that. So look at what he says here in verse 10. But whatever city, so we're back in Luke chapter 10, verse 11, um, or verse 10, whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the street and say, the very dust of your city, which clings to us, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, Know this, the kingdom of God has come near you. Wherever you travel, the kingdom of God is there because if you've believed on the Lord Jesus, he is in you. So then he says, but I say to you, it is more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida, for If the mighty works were done in you that had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at that judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. And then he says, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. I'm not going to go to it now, but in Proverbs uh, 9, it talks about don't correct a scoffer, but you can correct a a godly man because he will learn and he will grow. Um, So... We have to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 um, calls us ambassadors. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. He says, um, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The Holy Spirit of God in you and me was his plan and is his plan. And of course, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus' final sending words to his disciples, 19 and 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, for I will be with you, or I am with you, even to the end of the age. The harvest is all around us. Whether we take off on a road trip and uh, we're focused at time, maybe on a mission trip and we're focused on, on sharing Christ wherever we go or in our daily lives, wherever we are, there's this focus and there's this time for you and me. So it's really not so much what we take on the trip, is it's who you're taking, who is with you. It's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I was just thinking about a couple of things left in my bag on the trip. Um, duct tape for your sister. Um, gloves for when your car breaks down and, and the engine is hot. And you have to have a trusty fire extinguisher to put out those arguments around you. <laughs> but mostly to point it on yourself because that's where a lot of our trouble is from. So um, family and friends, we're here helping each other on this journey. And uh, there's a lot of wolves, there's a lot of stuff, and we need each other. We need to help each other. We have the gifts to help each other. It's for the building up of God's kingdom. So um, as God leads you today, um, may you be poised and ready just like the disciples. They said, we'll go. And 70 or so said, we'll go. And they went out before Jesus. They, they said, the kingdom of God has come near you today. Everywhere you go, the kingdom of God comes near people that need to know Jesus need to know Jesus. So just one more time that we're becoming more and more a house of prayer because that's the baseline. We're talking to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so as you become uh, a person of prayer more and more, as we become as a church together, praying together and seeking God's future for us, the next step in us together, um, just a little bit about our prayer canopy out here. We were encouraged the other day, there was a couple that pulled in and they gave um, quite a chunk of money to us. Glenn was sitting out there and it was a considerable amount of money and they just said, we've seen you out here and we believe in what you're doing. We believe, so take that for the church and we just went, thank you, Lord. Right away, it, this is from God saying, you're on the right track because we're gonna need to be Comfortable. If you're not comfortable with prayer, get comfortable. Because that's just talking to God. And with each other, that's just talking to God with each other. Get comfortable. Prayer is how we talk to him and how he talks to us. And so they're seeing that and there are going to be people that need us. They're going to know that we are a house of prayer. And when stuff starts happening, they're going to be stopping. So we have cars break down out there. There's a couple of young guys broke down with their car. And uh, so they got to hear the gospel. <laughs> I said, look, where do you, where do you live? And, and I said, I can give you a ride back to get the other car. And okay, I said, but I said, so we, we believe in prayer. So if you allow us to pray over you, I'll give you a ride. 
<laughs> just saying. And then on the way, I just told him, do you know Jesus? And he just said, well, you know, I used to go to church, and, but that's, you know, that's kid stuff. And it's like, oh, I said, you're going to know this. He's 18 years old. And I said, in the future, you're going to need Jesus. And let me tell you, when you seek him with all of your heart, he will let you find him. And that's all the further I could get with them. You are given opportunities all around you. And maybe just a little bit, most of it is praying. When you're with somebody that doesn't, you're just praying. God is going to do the change. But he may give you the privilege to, to speak. But you're praying all the time. You're communicating with him all the time. All right? Our time is over. Lynn has shown me. Time's up. So, uh, as usual, if you would like help in praying, uh, Glenn and I will be up here, and of course you can pray with each other. Um, thank you for being here today, and thank you for journeying with us. Um, we're in a, a, a weird time, and we need one another to uphold one another, to keep our focus and not get distracted. Okay, uh, bow with me as I pray. Father in heaven, we praise your name and we thank you that you have given us this new life. That once upon a time, we realized we had bodies and we could see how fast we could run and we tested our bodies to see how much we could take and, and do. And then one day, you spoke to us about a new life. Maybe it was through a Sunday school teacher or a pastor or maybe our parents or a good friend spoke to us about a new life, a life within a life a spirit birth, a connection with the one who created us and has promised eternity forever to know this one. Lord, we thank you for showing us your glory in so many ways and blessing us in so many ways. We thank you for getting us ready for what's coming down the road. We need each other. We need you. We need to represent you well, not ashamed that we're a house of prayer, not ashamed of the gospel. And Lord, we thank you that we're getting ready for people that are gonna come that need to know the love of God through Christ, him crucified, risen again. They're gonna need to see people that know God's love and that can share God's love and that can walk in that power before him. They're gonna need us to be ready to be powered up and to be ready because we've been walking so close with you, Lord. We know we can't do anything without you. So Lord, help us as we become more and more connected with you by being individual house of prayer and a corporate house of prayer wherever we go, calling on your help. We need you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>